Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. In a niche all his own, apart from other great tellers of tales of terror, stands the moody, dark, and devious genius, Edgar Allan Poe. Obscure and ambiguous, the rolling periods of his prose are not for the casual reader, no more than for the casual listener. But for sheer suspense compounded of horror piled upon horror, literature offers nothing more awful than the pit and the pendulum. The terror of the black pit would have sufficed a lesser imagination, but to this, the macabre intellect of Poe added the inescapable doom of the razor-sharp pendulum, and then piled on the rats and the moving walls of red-hot iron until the edge of the unbearable is reached. Can you take it? Can you listen through the next half hour? Try. Try to listen to Mr. Vincent Price, starring in The Pit and the Pendulum, which begins in exactly one minute. This is Bob Wright, with the answer to the greatest challenge in cigarette history. The challenge was... Can a cigarette be made that will give decidedly better filtration and also give easy draw with full natural tobacco flavor? The answer is Kent. Kent with a revolutionary new Micronite filter that gives Kent decidedly better filtration, definitely less tars and nicotine than any other leading filter brand. Kent filters best. The answer is Kent with the full, rich flavor of the world's premium quality natural tobaccos and an easy draw. Yes, of all leading filter brands, Kent filters best. Kent filters best. Tomorrow, pick up a pack of Kents with a revolutionary new Micronite filter and enjoy the most important advance in the progress of filter smoking. Kent filters best. And now... Mr. Vincent Price stars in Edgar Allan Poe's immortal story of punishment by terror, The Pit and the Pendulum, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was sick, sick unto death with that long agony, and when at length they unbound me and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum from which emerged the syllables of my name. Captain Jean d'Albret. Good fathers, gentlemen. We hear you, my son. Even now I have no knowledge of where I am or to whom I may be speaking. You're speaking to me, my son. I am Fra Pedro Despia prior of the Dominicans of Segovia, and Grand Inquisitor for all Spain. This, then, is the court of the Inquisition? It is. But I am a French officer. That is true. A soldier and creature of the arch-fiend, the Antichrist, Napoleon Bonaparte, who even now is at the gates of Madrid, while his general, La Salle, menaces our city of Toledo itself. Nonetheless, I am a prisoner of war. By what right do you try me in this court? Let the clerk read the charges against the prisoner. Item, that on the fourth day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1808, the said Captain Jean d'Albray did wed and espouse that most noble lady, the Doña Beatriz Valdez, niece and ward of the illustrious... One moment. Excellency? This marriage was a deplorable thing, if you like, but lawful marriage, however regrettable in a case like this, is no sin nor crime. There are other matters in the indictment. Then continue, but give us nothing that is not material. Item, that on the 12th of October, 1808... The said Jean d'Albray, being in command of a battery of light artillery, did direct the fire of his guns against the holy church of Santa Marta the Innocent, and thereby, of his wicked malice, destroyed that church utterly. Captain d'Albray, is this charge true? Yes. You admit it. Good father, the church blew up, did it not? Would you boast of your sin, young man? It blew up because it was stored with kegs of gunpowder for your army. I had every right to fire on it. 
And that is all the defense you have to make? I tell you, I had every right to fire on it by military law. Is military law above God's law? I don't know. I did my duty. Long live the emperor! You stay because... Captain Dalbray, mark what I say. No man, however great his heresy, is condemned to be burnt in the fire if he first recant and acknowledge the error of his ways. Do you so? I cannot. I was under orders. I obeyed them. Then, Jean d'Albray, there can be no mercy, no pity, since there is no atonement. The sentence of this court, therefore, is... I had swooned in terror, yet I will not say that all of consciousness was lost in the deepest slumber, no, in delirium, no, in a swoon, no, in death, no. Even in the grave, all is not lost, else there is no immortality for man. moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. But first, some big news. Long pole, new Pontiac, the pole, new Pontiac, the pole, new Pontiac is here. With the Pontiac front seat that lets you in the back seat, Pony automatically moves up and back. Automatically, a portable radio that pulls right out and plays all alone. When you plug it back in, it's a car radio, high fidelity too. What a nice tone! Set your speed on the new speedometer, on the automatically. If you go too fast, a buzzer goes buzz. Party automatically. More good reasons you love the bold new Pontiac. Party automatically. The bold new Pontiac is here. And now, Mr. Vincent Price in The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. No, even in the grave all is not lost. There were shadows of memory which told me indistinctly of tall figures that lifted me and bore me in silence down, down, still down, until a hideous dizziness oppressed me at that descent into the earth. There was a vague horror at my heart because of that heart's unnatural stillness. Then, as consciousness swam back to my wits again, darkness, a damp stone floor in darkness. Oh, Beatrice, oh, my wife. Did you call me, Jean? Beatrice, you here in the dungeons of the Inquisition? No, my poor Jean. I am only here in your imagination. Am I mad, then? No, but your brain is fevered. You only think you hear me. I hear you clearly. You won't leave me. As long as I am in your heart, I shall be here. Have they chained you to the wall? No. No, they, they've taken away my uniform. They've given me sandals and a robe of rough cloth. But I'm unchained... Beatrice, suppose, suppose they have buried me alive. Have courage, Jean. You must have courage. Then tell me, tell me where you are now, Beatrice, in the flesh, I mean. In the old house by the olive grove, scorned of my people. Yes, yes, I know. Each morning I climb to the hilltop and watch for them. Yes, Sometimes I think I hear gun wheels rumble in the hills and long moving columns with the red dust rising above them. Go on, go on. First come the heavy cavalry in plume-crested helmets, 
On their flanks, wheeling like hawks, light hussars in blue and scarlet. And behind them, in a glitter of bayonets, as vast as light points on the sea, rank upon rank, the long gray coats and tall bearskin caps. And the old guard and the grand army. It's only a vision, my dear one. They do not come. Will they ever come, Beatrice? I cannot tell. Then, then I must face, face what has been prepared for me. Can you stand up, Jean? I, I think so. Then walk. Yes. Walk as far as you can. Measure the limits of the cell. If this is not a tomb. Oh, I'll try, Beatrice. I'll try. This robe impedes me, and the floor is treacherous with slime. But, but I'll try. I'll... Look out, oh. Jean. Oh. I'm all right. I, I fell on my face. The robe tripped me. But, what, Jean? But my hand is in front of me, lower than my face. But I, I feel nothing. Nothing, Jean. It's a pit. A deep circular pit, and I fell on the very edge of it. They would have had you walk into it. Yes. But you didn't. You're saved, Jean. Saved, Beatrice. Saved. My torture has been merely postponed. At last, a deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, I know not. But when I opened my eyes once again, I, I could see. Yes, see. My prison was large and lofty, its walls formed of massive iron plates. A wild, sulfurous luster, I, I could not trace its origin, lit up the dungeon and the circular pit. I could see, but I could not move. I lay on my back on a low framework of wood, securely bound by a long fastening resembling a surgical bandage. The bandage passed round and round my body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm. With much exertion, I could supply myself with food from an earthen dish on the floor beside me. It was meat, highly seasoned, and there was no water. Beatrice... Beatrice, where are you? I am here, Jean. Your voice sounds stronger, and I, I can see you. You are weaker, my dear, and more fevered. Look, Beatrice. Where? At the ceiling of this room, 30, 40 feet up. What do you see? I see, painted on the ceiling, a figure of Father Time. Yes, but this Father Time carries no scythe. He carries instead what looks like a gigantic pendulum from an ancient clock. And the pendulum is moving. The painting cannot move. But I swear the pendulum did. It swung a little back and forth, just like a real pendulum. Beatrice, take care. Take care of what? Take care of the rats. The rats from the pit. They're swarming out in dozens. You can see their eyes glitter. What do they want? What do they want? I've caught the scent of the meat in the dish beside you. They'll not get it. Go! Go away, you vermin! Au revoir, Jean. Au revoir. Beatrice, where are you going? I can hardly hear you. You are sending me away, I'm Jean. I'm sending you away. My poor loved one. You can't bear to see the rats running about my feet, can you? Even when you know I'm not here. Beatrice. It is true, Jean. You are sending me away. Yes. Yes, it's true. In a cell swarming with vermin, there are others I would rather see here. I would rather see. Did you call me Captain Dalbray? Then in spirit, I am here. Go. I command you, Fra Antonio. Go! Not until I have first told you what is in store for you. Which is? Listen. Do you hear anything? Yes, yes, I, I hear something. Turn your eyes upward. Look at the ceiling. The pendulum. Aye, the pendulum. It is descended. Only a foot or so as yet. As you notice, it is not really a pendulum. No? No. Its underside is a crescent formed of razor-sharp steel. You mean... You mean... A ponderous weight, Captain Dalbray. Its movement is slow now, but soon it will take on momentum. It will swing wider and wider, and with each broad movement, it will creep a trifle lower. The steel is directly over me. Yes, above.
above the region of your heart. How long before? You need have no immediate fear. It will not be too soon. But how soon? Who can tell? Minutes, hours, days. Who can say how long it was? It might have been many days before that hideous blade swept so closely as to fan me with its acrid breath. Down, still unceasingly, still inevitably down, the sharp steel flashed past within three inches of my chest, and then, only then, Beatrice, Beatrice. I hear you calling, Jean. I am here. Oh, Beatrice. Is there no hope, my dear? How can there be? Ten, twelve more vibrations, and it will fray the threads of my robe only lightly as a razor in a delicate hand. There will be many sweeps down before it bites deep. I can't escape it, and yet... And yet? And yet, if only I could use my wits. You kept me away from you, Jean. You locked me out of your thoughts. If I am here only in your thoughts, why should I fear the rats? The rats? The rats? Do they still swarm here? Uh, and over the meat platter. Yes. They have taken nearly all your food. Yes, they are ravenous. They have sharp teeth. The meat is oily and spiced. If I take what remains of it, scatter you, vermin! Rub that meat on the bandages that hold me here. Try it, Jean. Try it. It may be too late. If I move my body of a fraction of an inch up, I... Try it, I tell you. Try. Can I stand those rats crawling across me? Can the flesh bear it? Oh, one of them has leaped on the wooden framework. Yes. Another follows. They are gnawing at the bandage. Seven, eight more sweeps of the pendulum. Does the bandage give way? Lie still, Jean, lie still. Ten, a dozen rats now. Is death, I wonder, worse than this disgust? A dozen sharp knives could do no better. The bandage has loosened to ribbons. If you move sideways, yes. carefully, and I... drop to the floor. It is. Beatrice, I, I, I can't move. My arms and legs are numb. There is no the power to... The steel has frayed your robe. A minute more will be too late. Try. Then with all the strength that is in me and the hatred I bear, my enemies... You're free. Yes, the second time I'm... I'm free. See, Jean, the pendulum stops. They are drawing it back up through the roof. Each move I make is watched. You never doubted that? No. Yet with all they could do to you, they have failed twice. They will not fail a third time, my dear. Listen. What do you hear? A groaning, a grinding as of metal. It is only the cogwheels of the pendulum. But I think not, Beatrice. Why not? It seems to come from behind these iron-plated walls. It seems to shake the dungeon as a mill wheel might shake at it. Stand up, my poor Jean. Get up off your knees. I can't. I can't endure any more. Don't you sense even now the odor of the heated iron? Heated iron? Yes, the walls are beginning to glow red. Oh, Beatrice, I have been much humbled. But I, I won't have you see me in tears. I order you to go. Sure, in the name of yes, heaven. Yes, in the name of heaven, go. In just a moment, we continue with the third act of... Suspense. More families, far more families, use X-Lax than any other laxative. X-Lax is the preferred laxative for one important reason. X-Lax helps you toward your normal regularity, gently, overnight. Today, many doctors recommend trusted X-Lax for youngsters as well as grown-ups. That's because X-Lax gives you the relief you want, the gentle way that nature wants, without upset. When you take chocolated X-Lax at night, it does not disturb your sleep. And X-Lax is so effective that the next morning, you'll be well on your way toward your normal regularity. Seldom, if ever, will you need X-Lax the next day. Little wonder that of all the laxatives made today, tablet, powder, or liquid, X-Lax is the most popular. Next time, any time that you or any member of your family needs a laxative, 
Make that laxative pleasant-tasting chocolated X-Lax. Introductory size, only 15 cents. And now... Act Three of The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. A suffocating heat pervaded the prison. I could draw no breath of air into my lungs. Against the loom of that fiery destruction, the thought of the pit and its coolness came like balm. Does the pit please you, Captain Dalbray? You again? Do you find its contents pleasing? Not the pit. And how shall you avoid it? Look! This dungeon has changed its shape. That is true. The walls are closing in. It was formerly a square, and now, now it, it is... it is flattening slowly towards the center to force me into the pit. Of course. It will force you along with me. Again, apparently, you must be told, Captain Dalbray, that you are speaking only to your own sick fancy. I am not here at all. Farewell. How flatter and flatter grew the red-hot walls. I shrank back. But the closing walls pressed me relentlessly onward toward the loathsome pit. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold. I screamed once. I tottered on the edge of the pit. I averted my eyes. Then there was a discordant hum of human voices. And then a loud blast of many trumpets. The fiery walls rushed back. An outstretched arm caught my own as I fell fainting into the abyss. It was that of General LaSalle. The French army had entered Toledo. The Spanish Inquisition was in the hands of its enemy. Suspense, in which Mr. Vincent Price starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe, adapted for suspense by John Dixon Carr. In a moment, the names of tonight's supporting players and a word about next week's story of suspense. Here's good news for everyone who appreciates fine music. Hein Soups offer you the LP record bargain of the year the best of 57 in classical music by famous RCA Victor. It's a genuine Red Seal LP of $3.98 quality, yet it costs you just $1 in cash and four labels from any of Heinz condensed soups. That's right, just a $1 bill and four Heinz soup labels. Think of it, 43 minutes of the world's great music, Highlights from eight RCA Victor albums performed by famous orchestras directed by Morton Gould, Arthur Fiedler, Fritz Reiner, and others. Here's the only way you can get this wonderful 12-inch record. Send a $1 bill and four Heinz soup labels to Best of 57, Box 57, Rockaway, New Jersey. I repeat, Best of 57, Box 57, Rockaway, New Jersey. Send for yours right away. Supporting Mr. Price in The Pit and the Pendulum were Ellen Morgan, Jay Novello, Ben Wright, and John Hoyt. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> 